with. Um, first of all, a wonderful plenary speech of the morning, and then our concurrent session later on. Um, so, it's my pleasure this morning to be introducing our last plenary speaker of this conference, Mark James, which you have seen yesterday um, participating in a lot of sessions very attentively um, and positively, so thank you for that. Um, when thinking about our plenary speakers, we wanted to bring in new people that haven't been coming for the last few decades. And Mark James is another one of Mera and Senet Hoja's discoveries from last year's AAAL conference in Texas, Dallas. I think, so it's their first time in Turkey, and we are very happy to be introducing them to this audience, and to Turkey, actually. Um, so who is he? He is an Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics and the Director of Undergraduate Studies in the English Department at Arizona University, Arizona State University, sorry. Um, there he teaches a variety of undergraduate and graduate courses. So it's a range of classes he provides. And he deals with a range of issues such as curriculum, teaching, learning in the second language, um, acquisition. In particular, he's interested in practical and theoretical aspects of skills transfer, which is also topic of his speech today, as you can see. Um, and he has published in various international journals, and he has been giving presentations in big international conferences, such as the AAAL, TESOL, AILA, etc. So we are very happy to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Mark James to do his plenary speech now. Can you hear me at the back? Is, the, is that okay? Great. Well, good morning, um, and thank you for that very nice introduction. I'd like to start by just saying thank you very much uh, to the Conference Organization Committee for inviting me to give this presentation today. Uh, I'm very happy to be here as part of the Savannah University Freshman English Conference uh, 2014. And I know this is possible only because of this committee's support and hard work to make all the necessary arrangements. And an additional thank you to Zena, um, who started this ball rolling a year and a half ago by asking if I might be able to come to this conference, and who has been my, my direct contact person since then in making all of the arrangements. And who I didn't know until last night was such a good drummer. If you were at the dinner last night, you understand that. Um, and one more thank you to everyone in the audience this morning. Uh, I know your time is valuable, and I appreciate you spending a little bit of time here with me this morning. I'll also say that it's particularly exciting that the conference is here in Turkey. Uh, I regularly go to conferences, and usually when I tell my wife that a conference is coming up, she says, great, I'll see you when you get back. And off I go, by myself. But this time I must have been a little too excited when I told her that I was going to a conference in Istanbul, because she immediately said, great, and I'm going with you. <laughs> so she's upstairs right now waiting for me. Anyhow, my plan this morning uh, is to speak for about 45 minutes, uh, so we'll have 15 minutes for questions. Let me also point out that I haven't prepared a handout uh, for this presentation, because I'll put my PowerPoint slides um, and an audio recording of this presentation on my website after the conference. Uh, the website address is up here on the screen, and I'll put it up again at the end of the presentation. As for the topic of the presentation, as you can see from the title, we'll be focusing on transfer of learning, or learning transfer, in EAP education. And this is a topic I've been doing research on for the last few years. When I first saw the conference program, I thought this topic may at first look slightly out of place, given that many of the other presentations are connected by interesting themes, like the use of technology, the development of academic literacy skills, and in particular, critical thinking. But as we dig deeper into this topic, 
I think you will see that it actually is directly connected to many of the themes that we've been discussing at the conference. And if by the end of this presentation those connections don't seem apparent, um, we can talk about it some more in the question and answer session afterwards, and perhaps later in the, in the panel session that we do this afternoon. Anyhow, for now, we'll look at this topic from the perspective of four key questions. What is learning transfer? Why is learning transfer important in EAP education? What kind of learning transfer, if any, occurs in EAP education? And what can EAP educators do to help promote learning transfer? So let's begin by clarifying what we mean by learning transfer. And I'll do it first with a little demonstration. I'm going to put a graphic up on the screen, and I'd like you to just look at it and try to figure out what it is. But don't say anything. So don't say anything. Um, but if you think you know what it is, please just raise your hand sl uh, silently so we can get a sense of how many people have identified the object. Three people. Okay. So now I'm going to add a little information. So now how many people think they know what the black and white image on the left side of the screen is? Okay. More? That's good. All right. we'll, try, we'll try another one, okay? And again, please just look at it and try to figure out what it is, but don't say anything. So, just a show of hands, how many people think that they know what this is? I think probably six or seven people. Okay? So now I'm going to add a little information. Okay, so now, another show of hands, how many people think they know what the image on the left side of the screen is? A few more people, a few more, okay, okay. Just in case that clue wasn't enough, that should help. Okay, and we'll do one more, just one more. So here's a picture of something that is very, very common. But don't say anything. If you think you know what the object is inside the yellow box, please raise your hand. Okay, so three. Okay. So here's a little help. So now, how many people think they know what the object inside the yellow box is? Really? Not everybody? <laughs> okay, so that's it for the pictures. But what exactly does this show? Well, when I put up the first slide for each of these three objects, many of us did not know what they were. Now, we all do know what a frog is, what a cow is, and what a nose is. We just didn't use that knowledge at first when we were trying to identify the mysterious objects on the slides. But when we got a little bit more information for each of those objects, many of us suddenly made connections. In other words, with the extra information, we were able to apply our knowledge of what frogs and cows and noses are so that we could identify the objects. And this is a simple illustration of learning transfer, which generally speaking refers to the application of learning in new situations. This includes applying what we know about frogs and cows and noses when we are trying to identify strange objects in new pictures. It also includes countless other situations, like when someone who has learned how to drive a car then applies that learning when driving a truck for the first time or when someone who has learned how to play guitar then applies that learning when trying to play piano for the first time, or when someone who has learned math at school then applies that learning when she or he goes shopping. 
So now that we have an understanding of what learning transfer is, an obvious follow-up question is why learning transfer is important in EAP education. Let me start to answer this question by looking a little more broadly at education in general. Formal education of any type rests on an expectation that learning will transfer. In many countries around the world, including, for example, right here in Turkey and where I work in the United States, children are required to spend years in a school system that includes regular classes in areas like math, history, science, geography, and so on. To justify this massive investment of a society's resources and individuals' time, there's obviously an expectation that time spent in the school system will impact students' lives in some way beyond the school. For example, when they're at home, when they're out in the community, when they've left school to enter the workforce, and so on. This expectation may be explicit. For example, stated in a mission statement, or in a list of goals in a curriculum document. Or the expectation may be only implicit. But either way, our formal education systems rest on expectations or assumptions that learning in school can and will transfer. With that in mind, educators in any subject area should be concerned about transfer. But EAP education is an area in which we should be paying particular attention to transfer. Because EAP learners typically have an immediate need to use what they've learned. Generally speaking, EAP education is any English teaching that relates to some kind of study purpose. For example, providing English courses to help non-native speakers of English successfully navigate through an academic course or an academic program taught partially or fully in English. And because EAP education often occurs right before or while the student is in the academic courses or programs taught in English, there's, there is a relatively immediate need for, for students to transfer their EAP learning. Now, if we as EAP educators could safely assume that what students learn in our classes would transfer when the need arises, we would not have to pay so much attention to transfer. But, there, but there's the problem. We can't assume that transfer will occur. The simple demonstration a few minutes ago with the pictures of the frog and the cow and the nose uh, demonstrated that. Because even though we all know what those things are, we know very well, uh, we didn't transfer this knowledge until the circumstances were right. When we had enough information to help us make the connections. And this is what a huge body of research on learning transfer in educational psychology has showed. That just because we have learned something does not mean we can transfer that learning. For example, in one of the most famous early studies of transfer, over 100 years ago, Thorndike and Woodworth had a group of people practice estimating the area of rectangles. Through the training sessions, the participants were able to improve their ability to estimate the areas of rectangles. But when they were then tested on estimating the areas of a larger range of rectangles, and estimating the areas of other shapes like circles, triangles, and squares, they didn't do as well as they had during training. So the researchers concluded that the participants' learning did not freely transfer. And this is reflected in, in the centuries worth of research on learning transfer since then. The findings have collectively shown that while learning can transfer, it often doesn't. So this will not come as a surprise to many of us. As teachers, we may have our own examples of situations in which we've seen students have difficulty transferring what they've learned. In one nice example I read about recently, a physics professor said that his students had successfully learned in class how to calculate how long it would take a ball to fall to the ground from the top of a tower. 
But when the students then had a test question asking them to calculate how long it would take a ball to fall to the bottom of a well, students complained that they hadn't been given any questions about wells in class. So, so it's clear that learning transfer is, is important in EAP education because of the immediate needs EAP students have to apply what they learn, and because we can't assume that students will transfer EAP learning. So, we may be wondering now if there's any hope for us as EAP teachers, or if we, if we should all just give up and find new jobs. Well, there's good news, so please do not give up yet. There is a pretty good-sized collection of research that has shed light on this question. What kind of learning what kind of learning transfer, if any, occurs in EAP education. So I'll talk for a few minutes now about what we've learned from this research. First, we know in general that EAP learning can transfer. A number of studies have produced evidence that students transfer learning from EAP courses to work in other courses. And this research has been done in a range of EAP contexts, including colleges and universities in Australia, Bahrain, Canada, New Zealand, and the US. For example, some studies have examined students' academic records and have shown that students who took a particular EAP course had significantly better uh, grade point averages and graduation rates than students who did not take that course. And this shows that something transferred from the EAP course. The second thing we know is that a variety of kinds of EAP learning can transfer. This includes learning related to reading, writing, speaking, listening, and academic study in general. For example, the ability to manage time, to find sources, to prepare for tests, and to conduct analyses. And third, if we expand our view and look at research that has provided evidence of EAP students transferring learning, not just across courses, but also across activities, we can build up an even more detailed picture of transfer in EAP education. And it gives us a sense of um, the specific circumstances under which EAP learning transfers. We can see, for example, that when EAP learning transfers, it can have a positive impact on the quality of a student's work. This includes, for instance, transfer that leads to students getting a higher score on a vocabulary or a grammar test, or a higher score on a reading or listening comprehension test, or making a smaller number of mistakes in an essay. But an improvement in quality is not the only kind of transfer, is not the only kind of impact that transfer could have. And we know less about whether transfer has an impact on students' speed when they're doing academic work. For example, uh, how much reading that they can do in a given amount of time, or how fluently they can speak. And we also know less about whether transfer has an impact on students' approach to doing their academic work. For example, whether they, whether they use certain kinds of strategies, like listening or speaking strategies, uh, when doing that work. We can also see that when EAP learning transfers, it's sometimes prompted, in the sense that activities provide explicit hints to students about what they should transfer. For example, if students are asked to complete a grammar or vocabulary test that is in a multiple choice format, it's relatively obvious to the students that they are supposed to try to transfer something that they learned previously about grammar or vocabulary. And as a result, this kind of transfer is relatively easy because it's simply a matter of recognizing something on a provided list of choices. But we also have plenty of evidence that EAP students 
uh, transfer learning in more spontaneous ways, in activities that are open-ended and that don't provide explicit hints about what the students should transfer. For example, when students are asked to write an essay or to participate in a group discussion, and they're not given any more specific instructions than that, if transfer occurs in those situations, it's relatively spontaneous. Because students have had to work out for themselves what learning they can transfer. And that's an important distinction. Because spontaneous transfer is more difficult than transfer that's prompted. And one last thing we can see is that when EAP learning transfers, it can occur across varying distances. What this means is that EAP learning can transfer when the learning situation and the transfer situation are similar. For example, when they occur around the same time or in the same place or when they deal with the same kind of subject matter, or when the activities have a similar format. In these cases, when transfer occurs, we can call it near transfer, because of those similarities between the situations. But EAP learning can also transfer when there are important differences between the learning situation and the transfer situation. For example, when these situations are separated by a few weeks or a few months or when these situations involve working with different subject matter, or in different locations with different people, or they involve different kinds of activities. In these cases, when transfer occurs, we can call it far transfer because of these differences between the situations. So we know that EAP learning can transfer across different distances. And this is important because far transfer is typically more difficult than near transfer. But we would still like to learn more about transfer distance and EAP learning because most of the transfer that we have seen in research is relatively near. So we don't know too much about whether EAP learning transfers to situations that are far in lots of different ways. So based on the research that's currently available, it's clear that EAP learning can transfer under a variety of circumstances. We still have a lot to learn about transfer, but I think the picture we currently have is positive and gives us EAP educators a lot to work with. So I strongly recommend that we do not give up and quit our jobs because we think promoting transfer is hopeless. It's not hopeless. And we have lots of evidence that it does occur. But just because it can occur doesn't mean that it will. So it makes sense for us to do whatever we can to try to help promote transfer with our EAP students. And with that in mind, I'll spend the rest of my time this morning talking about this question. What can EAP educators do to help promote learning transfer? A general answer to this question is that we can try to make our courses as conducive to transfer as possible. That sounds fine, but how exactly do we do that? Well, there are specific concrete things that we can do. And I'm going to demonstrate this by taking a close look at one important aspect of many EAP courses, the course textbook. Textbooks play a central role in many EAP courses and they have a strong influence on the teaching and the learning that go on in a course. So it makes sense that if we are trying to make our courses as conducive to transfer as possible, we want to find books and use books in ways that will help us to achieve this. And to do that, it's helpful to be able to evaluate a given textbook's potential to help promote transfer. So I'm going to walk us through an evaluation of one example EAP textbook. I know this is very small, but I'm going to show us parts of this in a minute. Um, this is a, an evaluation tool that I created recently for practical use by teachers. This tool brings together current ideas about how teaching can help promote transfer. So you'll see, for example, in a minute, 
that some of the questions here are about the kind of practice that students would get. And other questions are about the kind of abstract thinking students would do when they use a particular textbook. That's because we know that there are two main ways that transfer can occur. Automatically, which we can promote through practice, and intentionally, which we can promote through abstract thinking. So you may notice those patterns, those two different types of uh, uh, transfer that we're trying to promote when we walk through these questions in a minute. So this is the actual evaluation tool. And as I said, I know it's very small, but we'll, we'll take a look at the specific parts in, on the next few slides so you'll see all the questions. Um, also, I'm going to make a copy of this uh, available um, on my website for anyone to download after the conference as well. And I would encourage anyone to try using this uh, to evaluate their textbooks. Um, but what's important to notice here on this screen is just that this tool is one page with a blank table at the top. And underneath the table, there are two steps, which have questions for the user, the teacher who's using this, to answer. So to evaluate a textbook, the user just fills out the table at the top by answering the questions in the two steps underneath. And basically, step one asks, what are students supposed to learn in a given unit in a textbook? And step two asks, in a few ways, how are they supposed to learn this? So we'll take a look at that in a second. Uh, but generally speaking, using this is meant to be practical in the sense that first, the questions below the table are as concrete as possible. I had tried before, um, before I created this, to evaluate textbooks from a transfer perspective using only general descriptions of teaching, teaching for transfer techniques that you can find in teacher resource books. And I found that this was very time consuming and it was quite difficult to do. So I was trying to find a way that um, I could include, uh, that I could create an evaluation tool that would have more concrete descriptions of teaching for transfer techniques so it would be easier to use. So I analyzed a collection of 20 current textbooks from major publishers in English language teaching to see what patterns there might be related to a collection of general teaching for transfer techniques. And the patterns that I found in those textbooks, I incorporated into this tool. So it gives us a, a specific idea of what we might see when we look at a textbook. And second, this is meant to be practical in the sense that the results will be in the form of a table. Basically, we just fill out a table at the top. Uh, so it's relatively easy to interpret. That's important because one of the points made by transfer researchers is that transfer promoting techniques may already be familiar in many education contexts to many of us as teachers. So if there's a problem with transfer in a particular context, the problem may be that these teaching techniques not that they're not being used, but that they're not being used systematically enough. So the way that this tool shows graphically with a table, which of a collection of techniques are used to promote transfer of a given outcome, it should make it easy for the user to see quickly how systematically transfer is being addressed. So let's take a closer look. Um, and I'll walk us through an example. For this example, I chose a book from Cambridge University Press's collection of English for Academic Purposes books. I realize uh, one of the sponsors of the conference is uh, Pearson, so it's probably good that I chose a Cambridge University Press book. <laughs> we'll see you in a minute. Okay. Um, but that was, just, that was a random choice. Uh, this book is called Academic Encounters. Anybody familiar with Academic Encounters? Okay. I used this years ago. Um, I'm not connected to this book, other than I used it years ago, uh, but I'm not connected to this book or publisher in any way. I just looked at the EAP sections in a few online catalogs from major publishers to see if I could find an example. And this book was available, and since it's been around for over 15 years, uh, I think it's in its second edition, it seems to be very, fairly successful, fairly popular, so it's worth taking a look at. And we'll, we'll take a close look at one unit from this book. This is Unit 1 
And the title is Belonging to a Group. It's in level three of the series, and this book focuses on academic listening and speaking. And on the right side of the slide, that's the table of contents for this, for this unit. And you can see, or I'll tell you, that it's divided into two, uh, two chapters. The first chapter is called Marriage, Family, and the Home. And the second chapter is called The Power of the Group. So it's got a sociology theme. There are multiple interviews and lectures for the students to listen to, and the skills to be practiced are in four categories. Listening, speaking, vocabulary, note-taking. So there are two steps in evaluating this unit. Step one asks, by the end of this unit, what should students be able to do? So here we are trying to identify transferable outcomes explicitly targeted in the unit. And we can do this by looking for statements about what students should be able to do after completing the unit. These kinds of statements can often be found in a scope sequence chart at the beginning of a book, or in the, or in the introduction to a unit, or the introduction to part of a unit, or in a teacher's guide. In the unit that, we look, that we're looking at today, there is a description of the contents, as I showed you, at the beginning of the unit. And it looks like this unit targets quite a few transferable outcomes. There's a long list in those four categories of listening skills, speaking skills, vocabulary skills, and note-taking skills. So a teacher could evaluate this unit by looking at each of these. Or, if that's too much, by looking at only those learning outcomes that would be most important for that teacher in that context. For our purposes today, just to illustrate how this tool can be used, I'll look at just one of these items, one of the learning outcomes. It's the first one in the category of speaking skills, and it's sharing opinions. So now we'll move on to step two, and we'll look for ways that this unit looks like it can help to promote the transfer of students' ability to share opinions. So the first question in step two is, how, if at all, does the unit make clear that students can share their opinions outside EAP classrooms? That's important because if a unit does not make this clear, students are being left to work out on their own that transfer is possible. Leaving this for students to work out on their own reflects an underlying assumption that learning naturally leads to transfer which we know from research is not the case. So looking at this unit, we can see that one of the activities that requires students to share their opinions also has a title after the lecture. And this points explicitly to one situation in which students can share their opinions after lectures. Using a heading like this is one way that I've seen textbooks tell or show students that transfer is expected. And other ways are through the use of text labels like business report or meeting. Or through the use of pictures that show people communicating outside an English classroom. For example, in an office or in a library. Because these labels and pictures point to concrete situations in which students can apply what they're learning outside the EAP classroom. Also, besides just telling or showing students with headings and labels and pictures, some textbooks go a step further and ask students to think for themselves about where a targeted, a targeted outcome can be applied outside an English classroom. But I didn't find an example of that in this particular unit. The second question, this is the second question out of six. Uh, the second question asks how the unit demonstrates how to share opinions. This is important because it's more difficult for students to transfer something that they've only talked about rather than seen or heard in actual use. In this unit, one of the activities that requires students to practice sharing opinions includes a written example of part of a conversation in which two people are sharing opinions. It's an indirect demonstration because the target outcome 
sharing opinions, is listed at the beginning of the unit as a speaking skill. But the provided example is written. Indirect de demonstrations like this seem to be pretty common in textbooks, but it's also common to demonstrate a target outcome more directly. That means, for example, that if the target outcome involves speaking, the provided example would be spoken. And if the target outcome involves writing, the provided example would be written. Question three of six is a little more complicated because it has three parts. And this is the first part, which asks, how many activities require students to actually practice sharing opinions? This is important because it's more difficult for students to transfer something that they have not had a sufficient chance to use themselves. In this unit, I found four activities that appear to do this. And on this slide, we can see one of those activities. In this activity, students have to share ideas with each other about whether they think changes in the family structure are, are harmful to society. The next part of question three asks, how many of the practice activities require students to pretend to be in some other situation outside the EAP classroom. That's important because transfer is easier when learning occurs in ways that mirror transfer contexts. And one way to do this is to have students learn and practice while pretending to be in situations outside the EAP classroom. As I mentioned with the previous slide, I found four activities in this unit that required students to practice sharing opinions. Of those four activities, none of them involved pretending to be in situations outside the EAP classroom. But just to illustrate what we're looking for, here's an example of an activity in this unit that does get students to pretend to be in some other situation. This activity is for a different targeted learning outcome, uh, asking and answering questions, not sharing opinions. But you can see that in this activity, students are practicing asking and answering questions while doing a role play. They're pretending to be other people, and those people are obviously not part of the EAP classroom. Finally, question three asks, how many of the practice activities require students to share their opinion to solve a problem? This is, a, this is another way that we can mirror transfer contexts where language is usually a means to an end, not an end in itself. And here, by solving a problem, we mean activities in which students go beyond just giving and gathering information, and instead, the activities involve using information to make decisions or judgments. Of the four activities in this unit that required students to practice sharing opinions, none involved sharing opinions to solve a problem. But, again, there is an example of an activity in this unit that does get students to use a targeted outcome to solve problems. It's just for a different targeted outcome. Uh, in this case, the targeted outcome is listening for factual information. But you can see that in that activity, students have to listen for factual information, not just to gather the factual information, but to go beyond gathering that information to make a judgment about whether the information is surprising. And one more part of this activity asks what the content and context are for the problem-solving activity. That's because if there are multiple problem-solving activities, it's beneficial for transfer if the activities look different on the surface. For example, in this activity, students have to listen for factual information about whether the average age for marriage in various countries about that, so that they can judge uh, whether any of this information is surprising. For variation, students might be asked in other activities to listen for factual information about other topics. For example, about family size or about types of housing, so they can judge whether any of that information is surprising. Another way of introducing variation would be to have students uh, do practice activities while pretending to be in different contexts outside the EAP classroom. For example, in a tutorial or in a laboratory. 
Question four asks what students are required to generalize about related to sharing opinions. And generalizing here means thinking of abstract rules, principles, or patterns. And this page from the unit, as this page from the unit shows, students are given the specific words and phrases, I think, I believe, I feel, and in my opinion. And they are told that these are ways to express one's opinion. Because this information links specific examples, those words and phrases, to a general pattern, which is a function, it's a case of generalizing. And besides making a generalization about language function like this, it's also common in textbooks to make generalizations about language form, like connecting sentences and words to grammar rules or spelling rules, and to make generalizations about language meaning, like connecting words to their definitions. And besides language form, function, and meaning, which are three main aspects of language product, it's also possible to have students make generalizations about language process. For example, by asking students to think of helpful steps to follow in creating an essay, in giving a speech, in reading an article, or listening to a lecture. Another important part of question four is how the generalization is made. And in this unit, the generalization is given to the students. In other words, the connection is already made for them between the specific examples, I think, I feel, I believe, in my opinion, and the general function, language for expressing opinions. But this can be done in other ways that involve more effort for students. For instance, by asking students to look at examples of language use and choose suitable generalizations from a list of options, or to look at examples of language use and to create generalizations completely on their own. Next, question five, question five asks what students are required to analogize about related to sharing opinions. In this unit, students are not required to analogize about this target learning outcome. But to illustrate what this can look like, here's another activity related to a different target outcome that does involve analogizing. For the outcome, building background knowledge, students are asked to look at a list of words related to culture and to place them on a picture of an iceberg. The iceberg is an analogy for culture, meant to reflect the idea that there are aspects of culture that are visible, but that like an, like an iceberg, most aspects of culture are less visible. So in this activity, students are analogizing about language product, the meaning of words, phrases, and sentences, and they are given the analogy of the iceberg. Um, but as with the previous question about generalizing, it's possible for analogizing to involve not just language product, but also language process. For example, by asking students how building background knowledge is similar to doing something else. And it's possible for analogizing to involve not just giving students an analogy, but having them choose or create an analogy. For example, by asking them what they think culture is similar to. And the last question, question six asks how students are required to reflect on their ability to share opinions. In this unit, one of the activities asks students to compare their answers from an earlier opinion sharing activity. This kind of comparison with other students' work or with a provided model gives students the chance to notice their own strengths and weaknesses with that target outcome. It's also common though to ask students in a more explicit way to reflect on their ability by giving them some kind of self-assessment, perhaps in the form of a self-rating scale or a test with a key that they can use to interpret their own score. So this is uh, how I would actually fill out the form and I'm gonna zoom in. This is the completed form and I filled out the table. You guys can't see it at the back. This is what the table looks like. Even that's a little small, but I'm going to work my way across it and just explain how a teacher might be able to use this. So this is what we're left with. Um, and with this information, a teacher who is preparing to cover this unit in class to help students develop their ability to share their opinions could try to improve the unit's transfer promoting potential in several ways. And I'll explain that now by going from left to right across these columns. 
First, in relation to question one on this side of the table, besides just telling students that they can share opinions in spoken English outside the EAP classroom, the teacher could ask students to brainstorm themselves for locations and situations in which this could occur. Second, in relation to question two, besides giving students an indirect demonstration of sharing opinions in the form of a written, exercise, a written example, the teacher could give students a more direct demonstration by having them listen to a recording of people sharing opinions in English. For example, the teacher could record her or himself and a colleague doing one or two of the actual practice activities from this unit and then have the students listen to the recording. We can skip over question three because it shows that the students have several opportunities to practice sharing opinions. I found four different activities that allow them to practice that. But next, in the next column, uh, to fill in the gaps in the columns for question 3.1 and 3.2, there I didn't find any activities that fit those columns, the teacher could create activities that require students to practice sharing opinions while pretending to be in other situations and while solving a variety of problems. For example, the teacher could have students pretend to be classmates in a business course who have to decide what company to choose for a case study project. Or the teacher could have students pretend to be members of a student committee that has been asked by university administration to identify the biggest problems with the university's curriculum. Next column for question four. In addition to giving students generalizations, the teacher could ask students to generalize themselves. For instance, by having the students listen to examples of people sharing opinions and then asking the students to identify patterns in the words and phrases those people use. Next, to fill in the gap in the column for question five about analogies, the teacher could ask students how sharing opinions in spoken English is similar to something else that they know how to do. Maybe how to exchange facts, or even something more abstract like how to play a game of tennis. In which case, the students might suggest, for example, that both involve trying to make or score points. All right, the important thing here is just in the thinking. It's not in the actual answer, but it's in the process of thinking about analogies. And finally, for the last column, question six, in addition to having students compare their work with each other, which is an implicit way of encouraging reflection, the teacher could ask students explicitly to think about how well they are able to share opinions. So those are some specific things a teacher could do to supplement this unit based on our evaluation. And another scenario in which a teacher might be able to use this information is when choosing a book for a course. If a teacher has this information for two or three units from one or two, two or three books that they're considering adopting for their course, it would be easy to take a quick look at these tables and compare the books. The comparison might show that one book has fewer gaps than another, or that the gaps in one book are easier to supplement than the gaps in another book. In any case, this kind of comparison could give a teacher meaningful grounds for choosing one book over another. So, just to wrap things up, um, I hope, as the demonstration showed, using the textbook evaluation tool is a practical step that EAP teachers can take to try to make sure their classes are as conducive to transfer as possible. And I've tried to point out here that this is a worthwhile goal. On the one hand, we know that EAP instruction can result in the transfer of learning that has a positive impact on students' work. But on the other hand, we also know that transfer is not an inevitable result of learning. So just because EAP learning can transfer doesn't mean that it will. So it makes good sense for EAP educators to do whatever we can to try to help promote transfer rather than to just assume that it's going to happen. And one last point I'll make is to, to call out for more research on learning transfer in EAP education. We've learned quite a bit so far, but there are still gaps in what we know. For example, about how far EAP learning will transfer. So as we are all taking steps to make our teaching more conducive to transfer, if we can document our efforts by carrying out and publishing research on what we're doing, that work will be of real value, not only to our understanding of EAP education, but to our understanding of second language education more broadly, and even beyond that, to our understanding of effective teaching and learning in general. 
So that's it for me for today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And there's uh, my website. So uh, when I go back to uh, Arizona State, I will post a recording and my slides and the teaching evaluation, the, teacher, the textbook evaluation form on my website. So please feel free to visit and download. And my email address, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, and we have a little bit of time for some questions.
So I think we can just uh, alert our students to the, the likelihood that there are negative transfer climates outside the EAP to, uh, classroom in some cases, and then they have to decide what they're going to do. And we can also work on their motivation to transfer with them as well. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Professor James, I want to thank you for your interesting lecture. It's, it's interesting to know sometimes that as educators, we're applying instinctively techniques from research that we don't really know the names of. Mm -hmm. So I would also like to introduce you to my colleague, Kim Sinatria, who wrote the book from which you gave examples. Oh, and, uh, oh, oh fantastic. She's the writer of this, like this book. I don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> this is, yeah, <laughs> thank you.
conversations. I haven't seen much research that's been looking at those kinds of questions yet, but that, that's going to be a big question for us. Yeah, and so, so the connection there I would make is that it's about trying to mimic um, target context. So, you know, is technology helping with that or is it getting going out? That's a question. So thank you very much all for your very interesting speech and as you're probably expecting this by now, <laughs> very little token of appreciation. Um, so on behalf of Savannah University freshman team, please accept our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.